I have this dream of doing a spelling bee on steroids. The contestants line up facing a wheel labeled with a bunch of the world's languages. Step right up, spin that wheel, and wherever it happens to land, you have to read a word and write a word in that language's native writing system. Hoo -hoo. As a language nerd, there's a lot that intimidates me about this spelling bee, but I must confess, there's one maniacally tough written language that I really hope this wheel never lands on. Ooh, I am excited! Let's go through and list why each one of these scripts has some tricky letters, and then at the end I will reveal to you the language with the world's scariest spelling. Number 10! Wait, what was that? Uh, come again? This just in, but apparently someone else already answered my question. Uh, he swears that the worst script ever is... Thai? Hmm, really? I mean, I messed with Lao and Thai a few years ago, and yeah, they weren't super easy, but... Thai? Uh, okay, here's his complaint. See, when a written language grows up and gets old, the way people speak it changes over time, but the way people write the language stays fossilized. The result is historical spelling. And Thai has some blatant historical spelling. Not only is written Thai pretty old, but even when it was new, it modeled its letters on Sanskrit, so it inherited fossils from the get-go. Thai has an alpha syllabary, with 44 consonant letters for writing just 21 consonant sounds, plus vowels and tone marks, plus a complicated way of figuring out how all of those letters work together to tell you which tone to pronounce on which vowel. Yeah. But I think this missed the point. What is it about historical spelling that makes a script tough? Consider two people. First, the reader. Won't you consider the reader? A script is hard when I don't know which sound to say for the letters I'm about to read. And for the writer, this script is hard if I don't know which letters to use for the sounds I want to write. Now glance back at Ty. There's something regular and predictable about it, especially for the reader. We can sum it up in a not too long page on Wikipedia. We can dust our hands off and set you loose on the language and you should do fairly well. In fact, I think of Thai spelling as not too different from Greek in a way. A bunch of letters come together to represent a smaller set of sounds. It's that same many to one correspondence. I'll also like Thai, some sounds influenced others in predictable ways. And yeah, there aren't those Thai tones to deal with, but you're stuck with the Greek tonos system with its movable accents and double accents based on how pitch and vowel length used to work way back in ancient Athens. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Don't fear Thai, my friend. Look elsewhere. It's got mountains, it's got llamas, it's got Buddhists talking Dhamma. Welcome to Tibet. History tells us that Tibetans have this guy to thank for writing, Songtsen Gampu. Pardon the spelling there, <laughs> sneak preview. He brought kingdoms together to form the vast Tibetan Empire. He said, hey guys, we're Buddhists now. And around the year 630, he sent a young minister to India to learn how to write. What he brought back from India was a new alpha syllabary, just like Thai. They both emphasize consonants and surround them with vowels. They both came with Buddhism, so both have special conventions for transcribing sacred Sanskrit terms. And nowadays, they both have to deal with tones in convoluted ways they weren't designed to handle. But written Tibetan is much, much older. Here's the basics. You start with the base consonants with their built-in dummy vowels. Then you learn to write vowels and wuz and ros and yuz as little flags on the consonants. But it gets even more exotic. Tibetan can stack consonants, it can flip consonants, it can clunk together masses of consonants to build syllables that look like this. This is how Tibetans spell these words. And this is how they say them. Did that sink in for you? This is what people are reading. This is what people are saying. This tangled mess of consonants is why Yeti, Yache, is spelled Gya Vred. Why the Tibetan language is Yu, even though it's really Dbus. And this, the name for this Klingon looking beauty that is the Tibetan script, how do you think it's pronounced? Any clue? Time's up. It's Uchen. Yeah. If you think reading with these letters is hard, you should try writing with them. In Lhasa, the sounds tup might mean any of these words. It might mean overflows, accomplishes, sows, or even other forms of the verb accomplish, like accomplished and will accomplish. But guess what? Those are all spelled differently. 
the puzzles don't stop. Take two words with very similar spelling. The one spelled grogs gets pronounced ta. And grogs? Why, that's ro. Give up yet? Well, there is some logic here. Here's the deal. Tibetan has core letters. It has vowels around those core letters and then outside letters. And once you grasp that basic fact, you can start figuring out which letters to ignore. Like in this verb that looks like besags, B is a prefix and the S is a suffix. So you can just concentrate on getting these middle letters right. Suck, maybe. Okay, and now you're thinking, I get it. It's the vowel and some other letters in the middle of the syllable I care about. I, I can just ignore everything else. Bam, I'm Tibetan. Dangerous strategy there for two reasons. Number one, you need to know which letters not to ignore. And reason number two, well, you can't just drop letters and walk away like that. Tibetan has a complicated relationship where letters influence the pronunciation of other letters, meaning a silent letter can still change the way other letters get pronounced. So the name of one of the major schools of Tibetan Buddhism is written like this. We might innocently cross out all of these sounds and say something like ka -kyu, but that Tibetan u actually sounds like the German u there. It acts that way because of the final d that's after it. ka -kyu. Lucky you though, u to u isn't the only vowel change that works this way, and d isn't the only consonant that triggers it. So... Yeah, you're dropping letters here, you're influencing letters with ghost letters, and sometimes you're not even just dropping and influencing, you're finding out that whole clusters of letters interact together to create totally different sounds. Complex patterns. It's all complex patterns. Now things ratchet up another notch when you put syllables together. Sometimes you'll find a letter that's silent, like, say, silent R before another consonant in the word che. So you might cross it out and then forget about it, just to have it suddenly pop out at you when you smash it against another syllable, like in this name. To keep every little bit of this in mind when you run crying to your Tibetan dictionary for help, because the Tibetan idea of alphabetical order is not organizing words by the first letter. No, 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 no. They use that root letter, wherever it happens to be. Why do you do this, Tibet? Science says that being a high-altitude mountain people, Tibetans have physiological advantages like increased blood flow to the brain. Maybe they're spending that power on this bizarre writing system. But honestly, they did try to get rid of this bad spelling karma. Uh, really, old Tibetan got a spelling reform in the year 800. And then, well, that, uh, that was it. 1,200 years ago. Think of what's happened in 1,200 years. The Viking Age, the Norman conquests of England, everything ever written in Thai, the last Mayan codices, Chaucer, Shakespeare, the Tokugawa shogunate. These are current events compared to the last time Tibet changed its spelling. That is some serious historical spelling. And it's why, when I'm standing there watching the wheel clack, clack, clack around, deciding my fate in that multilingual spelling bee, I really, really hope that wheel doesn't land on Tibet. But assuming we're thinking spelling means segmental scripts, ones where we're matching letters to sounds, but I'm going to step out of the bounds of this game show here because if we color outside the mandala lines, Tibetan isn't even the worst offender when it comes to historical <laughs> spelling. There's a written language that plays much faster and looser with its symbols and expects way more of readers and writers than Tibetan ever could. Thanks for joining me in my spelling bee. I really liked having you here. Stick around and subscribe for language. I'm Tibetan on you.